In this video, I'm going to use the open economy model to solve three practice problems that I've posted on the website. So if you haven't looked at those practice problems, uh, go ahead and pause the video and try to work them out now. And then when you're done, come back and unpause the video to check your work. So our first practice problem is, uh, actually the first two practice problems are based on quotes from the Back to the Future series of movies and in the first question it points out this is actually a true story that the US cut taxes significantly and raised government spending in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was president and the question asks us to work out the implications uh, of this policy uh, in the open economy model so we're gonna have to draw a three panel diagram and fill in two tables the first table just asks us how the curves are gonna shift and since only one policy was described, we can be pretty sure that only one of these curves is going to shift. We've seen this policy many times, going back to our first chapter on the loanable funds model. When the government spends more and cuts taxes, its public saving decreases, and public savings part of the savings uh, curve, so it's going to shift back. All the other curves won't change because capital outflow is not mentioned directly this has nothing to do with trade directly, so net exports won't shift, and no investment was described, so uh, investment is not going to shift either. So we're just going to have to shift the S-curve back and then use the model to work out the implications. So first we'll draw on the initial equilibrium. So we'll draw on a supply and demand curve for our loanable funds model. We'll draw on our original net capital outflow and we'll draw in our original net exports. And now we can find the initial equilibrium interest rate and real exchange rate. The loanable funds model shows us our initial real interest rate. Then we go over and find the initial net capital outflow. And then we just bring that down and use it to draw in our supply curve on uh, the market for foreign exchange and that tells us our initial equilibrium real interest rate. Now it's time to shift the supply curve back as we said we'll do on the previous uh, slide. So we're going to shift savings backward. That raises, raises the interest rate just like before in our original closed economy loanable funds model. Then we bring that higher interest rate over. Net capital outflow hasn't shifted but since the interest rate changed, we're going to move along the NCO curve and get a different amount of NCO in equilibrium. And then we bring that smaller level of net capital outflow and draw a lower supply curve or a supply curve shifted to the left in our uh, net exports diagram. And then we can see that the equilibrium real exchange rate has increased. So. Uh, at this point, we're ready to analyze what's happened to the equilibrium levels of saving, investment, net capital outflow, net exports, interest, and the real exchange rate. We'll actually start at the bottom since they're easiest to see on the graph. The real exchange rate has increased. Sorry, the, the real interest rate has increased and the real exchange rate has increased. And now we'll start working out the implications for the other variables. As we can see has shifted back, so we know that that has decreased. We know the interest rate has increased. So not surprisingly, net capital outflow has decreased. This wasn't a shift in the curve. It was just a movement along the curve. But that still means our equilibrium level decreased. And then we know in equilibrium, net exports equals net capital outflow. So net exports will decrease too. And we can see that on the graph as net exports and equilibrium has shifted to the left. Investment we can't see directly on any of these three panels. It's sort of hidden as part of demand in the first panel, but we can't be sure exactly what happened to it just by looking at what happened to demand in the first panel. What we do is we know that investment is inversely related to the real interest rate. So when the real interest rate increases, investment will decrease. And that's how we can figure out how to fill in this box. We'll repeat that strategy for all three problems in this uh, short video. Now we can move on to our next practice problem. We'll go a little faster here. In the 1950s, Japan 
didn't really make any good stuff, so there were, the U.S. did not have much taste for their products. Nintendo didn't exist, anime was not very big or may not have existed, and few people bought Japanese-made cars. Uh, I'm not even sure if Honda existed. But by the 1980s, Japan made all the best stuff. Nintendo was Japanese, Hondas were great cars, and Japan and Taiwan made most of the DRAM to power most computers. So, what's described here... Uh, what, what curve shift was is described here for Japan? So we want to think about the macroeconomic effect on Japan. In Japan ca Japan's case, it's nothing to do with savings, investment, or net capital flows. This is all about trade, and we can see from Japan's point of view that there's going to be an increased demand for exports, so an increase in net exports. So that's the curve we're interested in shifting. Let's go ahead and shift the net exports curve now. I've already drawn in the initial equilibrium uh, interest rate the, uh, from the equilibrium in the loanable funds market. We can bring that over and get the equilibrium level of net capital outflow, bring that down and show supply, which tells us the equilibrium in the, net, in the export and import market, which tells us the equilibrium real interest rate. Now we're going to shift the net exports curve, we could label that NX prime, and we get the new equilibrium in all three markets. As you can see, in for the most part, things didn't really change. We just have now a higher real interest rate. This example is probably familiar because we've worked it out in class and you've seen it in the book. So there was no change in, say, in the real interest rate. So we'll just put a dash here. As a result of that, there was no change in savings, investment, or net capital outflow. Because there was no change in net capital outflow in equilibrium, there wasn't a change in net exports. What happened is that as the demand for net exports increased and the supply stayed fixed, that just bid up the price. So we saw an increase in the real exchange rate. The question also asked on the previous slide, I don't know if you saw it, but does this provide an explanation for Japan's persistent trade surplus? And the answer is no, not really. Uh, an increase in net export demand, so the taste for Japanese products increasing over time, shouldn't have any effect in the long run on the amount of net exports uh, in the, for the Japanese economy. What should have happened is that the real exchange rate, uh, the, the, the purchasing power of the yen, the Japanese currency, should have increased dramatically over time. So Japan's trade surplus must be uh, caused by something else, maybe Japanese savings rates or something. This last question is based on a paper written by uh, three international finance economists, Mendoza, Quadrini, and Rios Roll, and they develop a really complicated model of how the U.S. could have more advanced uh, financial system and that can draw in a lot of capital inflow. Let's just analyze the effect. We'll take as given that there's going to be a large capital inflow to the U.S., and let's analyze what that macroeconomic effects of that are going to be. So in our case, there's a, there's a big increase in capital inflow that's going to shift net capital outflow in, and it also shifts the I plus NCO curve in since NCO is part of that curve. Nothing else was directly affected. This has nothing to do with saving or trade, so there's uh, the net exports curve is not affected, but we will see saving is indirectly affected as the interest rate gets changed. So we can draw on our initial equilibrium interest rate, bring that over to find the initial level of net capital outflow, and then bring that down, draw in supply, and find the initial level of the real equi equilibrium real exchange rate. And now we're going to shift the NCO curve in, and we're going to shift the I plus NCO curve in. We can see the immediate impact on the real interest rate. It went down, not particularly surprising. We bring that over and see that net capital outflow also decreased, and we bring that down as the supply curve in our foreign exchange market and see that the equilibrium real interest exchange rate must have increased. And we can see that by comparing these two points in this uh, third panel, we can see that 
if we started with a trade surplus, it must have decreased, possibly being, even becoming a deficit. If we started with a deficit, it should have increased in size. So we'll go ahead and fill that one in first. Net exports and equilibrium decreased, and net capital outflow and equilibrium decreased, since we know those two are equal. We know exchange rates went down. That was one of our observations, and we know the equilibrium real exchange rate went up. The only two we have left to fill in are savings. Savings we can see shifted back. Uh, sorry, the savings curve did not shift back, but there was movement along the curve where savings decreased. And we know that since interest rates are lower now, investment must have increased, even though we can't see it anywhere here on the graph. And that pretty much wraps up our analysis using the model. On the previous slide, it, it asked, is this an explanation for the U.S.'s large current account deficit? That's code word for, and hopefully you read this on the helpful hint, that we are running a large trade deficit. And the answer is yes, this does explain why we'd have a large trade deficit when these when this capital inflow is coming in, because we can see net exports were, you know, decreasing. So a deficit would have gotten worse, or a surplus could have gone to deficit. We don't know exactly where we started, but we know we ended up with uh, a bigger deficit or a smaller surplus. That wraps up all three practice problems. Hopefully those were not too difficult for you. Uh, if you still need more practice, there's a whole optional set of, of practice problems on the website. That's problem set 4A. It's optional, but you do need to know how to do these problems. It's absolutely critical for the exam and the quiz, which will be either on Friday or after spring break.